Hi guys and welcome to Global Crime Time. First things first, please smash a like on this video and if you're new to the channel, please hit the subscribe button. Don't forget the bell for notifications of when my videos are released. I'm going to start this video with a warning. We will be talking about murder, dismemberment and cannibalism. So if you have a sensitive nature, then this most certainly isn't going to be the video for you and you may want to switch off. Now, in this video, we will be talking about one of the most notorious serial killers and sex offenders in American history. He committed the murder and dismemberment of 17 men and boys between 1978 and 1991. Many of his later murders involved necrophilia, cannibalism, and the permanent preservation of body parts. He was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and a psychotic disorder, but was found to be legally sane at his trial. He was convicted of 15 of the 16 murders he had committed in Wisconsin and sentenced to 15 terms of life imprisonment on February 17th, 1992. He was later sentenced to a 16th term of life imprisonment for an additional homicide committed in Ohio in 1978. He was known as the Milwaukee Cannibal and also the Milwaukee Monster. We are of course talking about Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer was born in May the 21st, 1960 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The first of two sons of Joyce Annette and Lionel Herbert Dahmer. Due to various reasons, neither parent devoted much time to their son, who later recollected that from an early age, he felt unsure of the solidity of the family, recalling extreme tension and numerous arguments between his parents during his early years. Dharma had been an energetic and happy child, but became notably subdued after double hernia surgery shortly before his fourth birthday. At elementary school, Dharma was regarded as quiet and timid. One teacher later, later recollected she detected early signs of abandonment. Nevertheless, in grade school, Dharma did have a small number of friends. In October 1966, the family moved to Dawlstown, Ohio. When Joyce gave birth in December, Jeffrey was allowed to choose the name of his new baby brother. He chose the name David. From an early age, Dharma had a fascination with dead animals. In 1968, the family moved to Bath Township, Summit County, Ohio. The home stood in one and a half acres of woodland. Dharma began collecting large insects and dragonflies and moths and the skeletons of small animals such as chipmunks and squirrels. Two years later, during a chicken dinner, Dharma asked Lionel what would happen if the chicken bones were placed in bleach. Lionel, pleased by what he believed to be his son's scientific curiosity, demonstrated how to safely bleach and preserve animal bones. Dharma incorporated these preserving techniques into his bone collecting and also began collecting dead animals, including roadkill, which he would dissect and bury beside the hut. The same year, Lionel taught his son how to preserve animal bones. From his freshman year at high school, Dharma was seen as an outcast. By the age of 14, he had begun drinking beer and hard alcohol in daylight hours. He is known to have mentioned to one classmate who inquired why he was drinking scotch in a morning history class that the alcohol he consumed was my medicine. Although largely uncommunicative in his freshman year, Dharma was seen by staff as polite and highly intelligent but with average grades. When he reached puberty, Dharma discovered he was gay. He did not tell his parents. In his early teens, he had a brief relationship with another teenage boy, although they never had intercourse. When he was about 16, Dharma conceived a fantasy of rendering unconscious a particular male jogger he found attractive, and then making sexual use of his body. On one occasion, Dharma concealed himself in bushes with a baseball bat in lie in waiting for this man. However, he did not pass by on that particular day. Dharma later said this was his first attempt to attack someone. By 1977, Dharma's grades had declined. His parents hired a private tutor with limited success. The same year, in an attempt to save their marriage, his parents attended counselling sessions. They continued to quarrel frequently. When Lionel discovered Joyce had engaged in a brief affair in September 1977, they both decided to divorce, telling their sons they wished to do so amicably. 
Dharma committed his first murder in 1978, three weeks after his graduation. On June 18th, Dharma picked up a hitchhiker named Stephen Mark Hicks, who was almost 19 years old. Dharma lured the youth into his house. Hicks, who had been hitchhiking to a rock concert at Ohio, agreed to accompany Dharma to his house upon the promise of a few beers. According to Dharma, the sight of the bare-chested Hicks standing at the roadside stirred his sexual feelings. Although when Hicks began talking about girls, he knew any sexual passes he made would be rebuffed. After several hours of talking, drinking and listening to music, Hicks wanted to leave. Dharma didn't want him to leave. Dharma bludgeoned Hicks with a £10 dumbbell. When Hicks fell unconscious, Dharma strangled him to death with the bar of the dumbbell. He then stripped the clothes from Hicks' body before exploring his chest with his hands, then masturbating as he stood above the corpse. The following day, Dharma dissected Hicks' body. He later buried the remains in a shallow grave in his backyard before several weeks later unearthing the remains and paring the flesh from the bones. He dissolved the flesh in acid before flushing the solution down the toilet. He crushed the bones with a sledgehammer and scattered them in the woodlands behind the family home. In January 1979, on his father's urging, Dharma enlisted in the United States Army where he trained as a medical specialist at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. On July 13, 1979, he was deployed to West Germany where he served as a combat medic in the 2nd Battalion, 68th Armoured Regiment, 8th Infantry Division. Owing to Dharma's alcohol abuse, his performance deteriorated and in March 1981 he was deemed unsuitable for military service and was later discharged from the army. He received an honourable discharge as his superiors did not believe that any problems Dharma had in the army would be applicable to civilian life. After his return to Ohio, Dharma initially resided with his father and stepmother. He continued to drink heavily. Dharma was arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct for which he was fined $60 and given a suspended 10-day jail sentence. Dharma's father tried unsuccessfully to wean his son off alcohol. In December 1981, he and Dharma's stepmother sent him to live with his grandmother in Wisconsin. Dharma's grandmother was the only family member to whom he displayed any affection. They hoped that her influence, plus the change of scenery, might persuade Dharma to quit drinking, find a job and live responsibly. This new influence in his life initially brought results and in early 1982, Dharma found employment at the Milwaukee Blood Plasma Center. He held this job for a total of 10 months before being laid off. In January 1985, Dharma was propositioned by another man while sitting reading in the public library. Although Dharma did not respond to this proposition, the incident stirred in his mind the fantasies of control and dominance he had developed as a teenager and he began to familiarise himself in Milwaukee's gay bars, gay bathhouses and bookstores. By late 1985, Dharma had begun to regularly attend the bathhouses which he later described as being relaxing places. But during his sexual encounters, he became frustrated at his partner's moving during the act. In June 1986, he administered sleeping pills to his partners, giving them liquor laced with the sedatives. He then waited for his partner to fall asleep before performing various sexual acts. After approximately 12 or so such incidents, the bathhouse's administration revoked Dharma's membership and he began to use hotel rooms to continue this practice. Dharma read a report in a newspaper regarding the upcoming funeral of an 18 year old male. He conceived the idea of stealing the freshly interred corpse and taking it home. According to Dharma, he attempted to dig up the coffin from the ground but found the soil too hard and abandoned the plan. On November 20th, 1987, Dharma, at the time residing with his grandmother, met a 25-year-old man named Stephen Tuomi at a bar and persuaded him to return to the Ambassador Hotel in Milwaukee where Dharma had rented a room. According to Dharma, he had no intention of murdering Tuomi but rather intended to simply drug him and lie beside him as he explored his body. The following morning, however, Dharma awoke to find Tuomi lying beneath him on the bed, his chest crushed in and black and blue with bruises. Blood was also seeping from the corner of his mouth, and Dharma's fists and one forearm were extensively bruised. Dharma stated he had no memory of having killed Tuomi. To dispose of Tuomi's body, 
Dharma purchased a large suitcase in which he transported the body to his grandmother's residence. One week later, he severed the head, arms and legs, then filleted the bones from the body before cutting the flesh into pieces small enough to handle. Dharma then placed the flesh inside garbage bags. He wrapped the bones inside a sheet and pounded them into splinters with a sledgehammer. The entire dismemberment process took Dharma approximately two hours to complete and he disposed of all the remains excluding the severed head in the trash. For a total of two weeks following Tuomi's murder, Dharma retained the victim's head. After two weeks, Dharma boiled the head in an effort to retain the skull, which he then used as stimulus for masturbation. Eventually, the skull was rendered too brittle by its bleaching process, so Dharma pulverized and disposed of it. Following the murder of Tuomi, Dharma began to actively seek victims, most of whom he had counted in gay bars and he typically lured them to his grandmother's house. He would drug his victim before or shortly after engaging in sexual activity with him. Once he had rendered his victim unconscious with sleeping pills, he had killed them by strangulation. Dharma encountered a 14-year-old Native American male prostitute named James Dox Tater. Dharma lured the youth to his home with the offer of $50 to pose for nude photos. At Dharma's residence, the pair engaged in sexual activity before Dharma drugged Dox Tater and strangled him on the floor of the cellar. Dharma left the body in the cellar for one week before dismembering. He placed all of Dox Tater's remains, excluding the skull, in the trash. The skull was boiled and cleansed in bleach before Dharma noted it had been rendered too brittle by this process. He pulverized the skull two weeks later. On March 24th, 1988, Dharma met a 22-year-old bisexual man named Richard Guerrero outside a gay bar called The Phoenix. Dharma lured, lured Guerrero to his grandmother's residence, although the incentive on this occasion was $50 to simply spend the remainder of the night with him. He then drugged Guerrero with sleeping pills and strangled him with a leather strap, with Dharma then performing oral sex upon the corpse. Dharma dismembered Guerrero's body within 24 hours of murdering him, again disposing of the remains in the trash and retaining the skull before pulverizing it several months later. On April the 23rd, Dharma lured another young man to his house. However, after giving the victim a drugged coffee, both he and the intended victim heard Dharma's grandmother call, Is that you, Jeff? Although Dharma replied in a manner that led his grandmother to believe he was alone, she did observe that Dharma was not alone. Because of this, Dharma opted not to kill this particular victim, instead waiting until he had become unconscious before taking him to the county general hospital. In September 1988, Dharma's grandmother asked him to move out, largely because of his drinking, his habit of bringing young men to her house late at night, and the foul smells occasionally coming from both the basement and the garage. Dharma found a one-bedroom apartment at 808 North 24th Street and moved into his new residence on September 25th. Two days later, he was arrested for drugging and sexually fondling a 13-year-old boy whom he had lured to his home on the pretext of posing nude for photographs. On January 30th, 1989, Dharma pleaded guilty to the charges of second-degree sexual assault and enticing a child for immoral purposes. Sentencing for the assault was suspended until May. On March 20th, Dharma commenced a 10-day Easter absence from work, during which he moved back into his grandmother's house. Two months after his conviction, and two months prior to his sentencing for the sexual assault, Dharma murdered his fifth victim, a mixed-race 24-year-old aspiring model named Anthony Sears, whom Dharma met at a gay bar on March 25th, 1989. According to Dharma, on this particular occasion, he was not looking to commit a crime. However, shortly before closing time that evening, Sears just started talking to me. Dharma lured Sears to his grandmother's home where the pair engaged in oral sex before Dharma drugged and strangled Sears. The following morning, Dharma placed the corpse in his grandmother's bathtub where he decapitated the body. He then stripped the flesh from the body and pulverized the bones, which he again disposed of in the trash. According to Dharma, he found Sears exceptionally attractive and Sears was the first victim from whom he permanently retained any body parts. He preserved Sears' head and genitalia in acetone and stored them in a wooden box, which he later placed in his work locker. 
When he moved to a new address the following year, he took the remains there. On May 23rd, 1989, Dharma was sentenced to five years probation and one year in house of correction with work release permitting in order that he be able to keep his job. He was also required to register as a sex offender. Two months before his scheduled release from the work camp, on release, Dharma temporarily moved back to his grandmother's home before in May 1990 moving into the Oxford Apartments located on North 25th Street in Milwaukee. Dharma moved into apartment 213 in May 1990 and would murder 12 of his victims at this location. Within one week of his moving into his new apartment, Dharma had killed his sixth victim, Raymond Smith. Smith was a 32-year-old male prostitute whom Dharma lured to apartment 213 with the promise of $50 for sex. Inside the apartment, he gave Smith a drink laced with seven sleeping pills, then strangled him. The following day, Dharma purchased a Polaroid camera from which he took several pictures of Smith's body in suggestive positions before dismembering him in the bathroom. He boiled the legs, arms and pelvis in a steel kettle which allowed him to then rinse the bones in his sink. Dharma dissolved the remainder of Smith's skeleton, excluding the skull, in a container filled with acid. He later spray painted Smith's skull which he placed alongside the skull of Sears of Approximately one week after the murder of Smith, on or about May the 27th, Dharma lured another young man to his apartment. On this occasion, however, Dharma himself accidentally consumed a drink laden with sedatives intended for consumption by his guest. When he awoke the following day, he discovered his intended victim had stolen several items of his clothing, $300 and a watch. In June 1990, Dharma lured a 27-year-old acquaintance named Edward Smith to his apartment. He drugged and strangled Smith. Dharma placed Smith's skeleton in his freezer for several months in the hope it would not retain moisture. Freezing the skeleton did not remove moisture and the skeleton of this victim would be acidified several months later. Dharma accidentally destroyed the skull when he placed it in the oven to dry, a process that caused the skull to explode. Less than three months after the murder of Smith, Dharma encountered a 22-year-old named Ernest Milley. Miller agreed to accompany Dharma to his apartment for $50 and further agreed to allow him to listen to his heart and stomach. When Dharma attempted to perform oral sex upon Miller, he was informed that it cost you extra, whereupon Dharma gave his intended victim a drink laced with two sleeping pills. On this occasion, Dharma had only two sleeping pills to give his victim, therefore, he killed Miller by slashing, ar slashing his artery with the same knife he used to dissect his victim's bodies. Miller bled to death within minutes. Dharma then posed the nude body for various suggestive Polaroid photographs before placing it in his bathtub for dismemberment. Dharma repeatedly kissed and talked to the severed head while he dismembered the remainder of the body. Dharma wrapped Miller's heart biceps and portions of his flesh from the legs in the plastic bags and placed them in the freezer for later consumption. He boiled the remaining flesh and organs into a jelly-like substance which enabled him to rinse off the flesh of the skeleton which he intended to retain. To preserve the skeleton, Dharma placed the bones in a light bleach solution for 24 hours before allowing them to dry upon a cloth for one week. The severed head was initially placed in the refrigerator before also being stripped of flesh, then painted and coated with enamel. Three weeks after the murder of Miller on September the 24th, Dharma encountered a 22-year-old man named David Thomas at the Grand Avenue Mall and persuaded him to return to his apartment for a few drinks, with additional money on offer if he would pose for photographs. In his statement to police after his arrest, Dharma stated that after giving Thomas a drink laden with sedatives, he did not feel attracted to him, but was afraid to allow him to awake in case he would be angry over having been drugged. Therefore, he strangled him and dismembered the body, intentionally retaining no body parts whatsoever. In February 1991, Dharma observed a 17-year-old named Curtis Strauter standing at a bus stop near. According to Dharma, he lured Strauter into his apartment with the offer of money for posing for nude photographs with the added incentives of sexual intercourse. Dharma drugged Strauter, cuffed his hands behind his back and strangled him to death with a leather strap. He then dismembered Strauter, retaining the youth's skull, hands 
and genitals and photographing each stage of the dismemberment process. Less than two months later, on April the 7th, Dharma encountered a 19-year-old named Errol Lindsay walking to get a key cut. Lindsay was heterosexual. Dharma lured Lindsay to his apartment where he drugged him, drilled a hole in his skull and poured hydrochloric acid into it. According to Dharma, Lindsay awoke after the experiment saying, I have a headache, what time is it? In response to this, Dharma again drugged Lindsay, then strangled him. He decapitated Lindsay and retained his skull. He then skinned Lindsay's body, placing the skin in a solution of cold water and salt for several weeks in the hope of permanently retaining it. Reluctantly, he disposed of Lindsay's skin when he noted it had become too frayed and brittle. On the afternoon of May the 26th, 1991, Dharma encountered a 14-year-old Lao teenager named Konorak Dinfasomapho on Wisconsin Avenue. He approached the youth with an offer of money to accompany him to his apartment to pose for Polaroid pictures. According to Dharma, Konorak was initially reluctant to the proposal before changing his mind and accompanying him to his apartment where the youth posed for two pictures in his underwear before Dharma drugged him into unconsciousness and performed oral sex on him. On this occasion, Dharma drilled a single hole into Konorak's skull through which he injected hydrochloric acid into the frontal lobe before Konorak fell unconscious. Dharma led the boy into his bedroom where the body of 31-year-old Tony Hughes, whom Dharma had killed three days earlier, was. Hughes was lured by Dharma to his apartment upon the promise of posing nude for photographs. As Hughes was deaf, he and Dharma communicated using handwritten notes. He was strangled and his body left on Dharma's bed floor for three days before being dismembered, with Dharma photographing the dismemberment process. Konomak soon became unconscious, whereupon Dharma drank several beers while laying alongside him before leaving his apartment to drink at a bar and purchase more alcohol. In the early morning hours of May the 27th, Dharma returned to his apartment to discover Konorak sitting naked on the corner of the 25th and State, talking in Lao with three distressed young women standing near him. Dharma approached the women and told him that Konorak was his friend and attempted to lead him to his apartment by the arm. The three women dissuaded Dharma, explaining that they had phoned 911. Upon the arrival of two Milwaukee police officers, he told the officers that Konorak was his boyfriend and that he had drunk too much following a quarrel and that he frequently behaved in this manner when intoxicated. Two Milwaukee police officers escorted Dharma and Konorak to Dharma's apartment. The officers then left with a departing remark that Dharma take good care of Konorak. This incident was listed by the officers as a domestic dispute. Upon the departure of the officers from his apartment, Dharma again injected hydrochloric acid into Konorak's brain. On this second occasion, the injection proved fatal. The following day, May the 28th, Dharma took a day's leave from work to devote himself to the dismemberment of the bodies of Konorak and Hughes. He retained both victim skulls. On the June 30th, Dharma travelled to Chicago where he encountered a 20-year-old named Matt Turner at a bus station. Turner accepted Dharma's offer to travel to Milwaukee for a professional photo shoot. At the apartment, Dharma drugged, strangled and dismembered Turner and placed his head and internal organs in separate plastic bags in the freezer. Five days later, on July the 5th, Dharma lured 23-year-old Jeremiah Weinberger from a Chicago bar to his apartment on the promise of spending the weekend with him. He drugged Weinberger and twice injected boiling water through his skull sending him into a coma from which he died two days later. On July the 15th, Dharma encountered 24-year-old Oliver Lacey. Lacey agreed to Dharma's offer of posing nude for photographs and accompanied him to his apartment where the pair engaged in tentative sexual activity before Dharma drugged Lacey. On this occasion, Dharma intended to prolong the time he spent with Lacey while alive. After unsuccessfully attempting to render Lacey unconscious with chloroform, he phoned his workplace to request a day's absence. This was granted, although the next day he was suspended. After strangling Lacey, Dharma had sex with the corpse before dismembering him. He placed Lacey's head and heart in a refrigerator and his skeleton in a freezer. Four days later, on July the 19th, Dharma received word that he was fired. Upon receipt of this news, Dharma lured 25-year-old Joseph Brandhoff to his apartment. Brandhoff was strangled and left lying on Dharma's bed covered with a sheet for two days. Dharma removed these sheets to find the head covered in maggots. 
whereupon he decapitated the body, cleaned the head and placed it in the refrigerator. He later acidified Braidhoff's torso along with those of two other victims killed within the previous months. On July 22, 1991, Dahmer approached three men with an offer of $100 to accompany him to his apartment to pose for nude photographs, drink beer and simply keep him company. One of the trio, 32-year-old Tracy Edwards, agreed to accompany him to his apartment. Upon entering Dahmer's apartment, Dahmer placed a handcuff upon Edwards' wrist. When Edwards asked what's happening, Dahmer unsuccessfully attempted to cuff his wrist together, then told Edwards to accompany him to the bedroom to pose for nude photos. While inside the bedroom, Dahmer brandished a knife. He placed his head on Edwards' chest, listened to his heartbeat, and with the knife pressed against his intended victim, informed Edwards he intended to eat his heart. In continuous attempts to prevent Dharma from attacking him, Edwards repeated that he was Dharma's friend and that he was not going to run away. Edwards had decided he was going to either jump from a window or run through the unlocked door at the next available opportunity. Edwards stated he was going to use the bathroom. When Edwards rose from the couch, he noted Dharma was not holding the handcuffs, whereupon Edwards punched Dharma in the face, knocking him off balance and ran out the front door. At 11.30pm on July the 22nd, Edwards flagged down two Milwaukee police officers. Edwards told police that Dharma had held him at his apartment and threatened to kill him. Although they initially thought the story was dubious, the officers took Edwards back to Dharma's apartment. Dharma calmly explained that the whole matter was a, simply a misunderstanding, and the officers almost believed him. However, one officer spotted a few Polaroid pictures of dismembered bodies. The officer walked into the living room to show them to his partner, uttering the words, Are these for real? When Dharma saw that the police officer was holding several of his Polaroids, he fought with the officers in an effort to resist arrest. The officers quickly overpowered him, cuffed his hands behind his back and called a second squad car for backup. At this point, one of the officers opened the refrigerator to reveal the freshly severed head of a black male on the bottom shelf. As Dharma lay pinned on the floor, he turned his head towards the officers and muttered the words, For what I did, I should be dead. A more detailed search of the apartment conducted by Milwaukee's Police Criminal Investigation Bureau revealed a total of four severed heads in Dharma's kitchen. A total of seven skulls, some painted, some bleached, were found in Dharma's bedroom and inside a closet. In addition, investigators discovered collected blood drippings upon a tray at the bottom of Dharma's refrigerator, plus two human hearts and a portion of arm muscle, each wrapped inside plastic bags upon the shelves. In Dharma's freezer, investigators discovered an entire torso, plus a, plus a bag of human organs and flesh stuck to the ice at the bottom. Elsewhere in apartment 213, investigators discovered two entire skeletons, a pair of severed hands, two severed and preserved penises, a mummified scalp, and in the 57-gallon drum, three further dismembered torsos dissolving in the acid solution. A total of 74 Polaroid pictures detailing dismemberment of Dharma's victims were found. Beginning in the early hours of July 23, 1991, Dharma was questioned by Detective Patrick Kennedy as to the murders he had committed and the evidence found at his apartment. Over the following two weeks, Kennedy and later Detective Dennis Murphy conducted numerous interviews with Dharma, which when combined totaled over 60 hours. Dharma waived his right to have a lawyer present throughout his interrogations, adding, he wished to confess all as he had created this horror and it only makes sense that I do everything to put an end to it. He readily admitted to having murdered 16 young men in Wisconsin since 1987, with one further victim, Stephen Hicks, killed in Ohio back in 1978. Dharma readily admitted to engaging in necrophilia with several of his victims' bodies, including performing sexual acts as he disembarred their bodies in a bathtub. Having noted that much of the blood pulled inside his victims' chest after death, Dharma first removed their internal organs, then suspended the torso so the blood drained into his bathtub before dicing any organs he did not wish to retain and paring the flesh from the body. The bones he wished to dispose of were pulverized or acidified with Soilex and bleach solutions used to aid in the preservation of the skeletons and skulls he wished to keep. In addition, Dharma confessed to having consumed the hearts, livers, biceps and portions of thighs of several victims he had killed within the previous year, 
often tenderizing the flesh and organs prior to consuming them in meals flavoured with various condiments. Dharma would eventually plead guilty to every count of murder against him, and as the state of Wisconsin abolished the death penalty, he was sentenced to mandatory life for every murder, ensuring that Dharma would die in jail. But Dharma would not die of natural causes in jail. On July 3, 1994, a fellow inmate, Osvaldo Dorothy, attempted to slash Dharma's throat with a razor embedded in a toothbrush as Dharma sat in the prison chapel after the weekly church service was concluded. Dharma received superficial wounds and was not seriously hurt in this incident. On the morning of November 28, 1994, Dharma left his cell to conduct his assigned work detail, accompanying him with two fellow inmates, Jesse Anderson and Christopher Scarver. The trio were left unsupervised in the showers of the prison gym for approximately 20 minutes. At approximately 8.10am, Dharma was discovered on the floor of the bathrooms of the gym suffering from extreme head wounds. He had been severely bludgeoned about the head and face with a 20 inch metal bar. His head had also been repeatedly struck against the wall in the assault. Although Dharma was still alive and was rushed to a nearby hospital, he was pronounced dead one hour later. Anderson had also been beaten with the same instrument and died two days later from his wounds. Upon learning of his death, Dharma's mother Joyce responded angrily to the media. Now is everybody happy? Now that he's bludgeoned to death, is that good enough for everyone? The response of the families of Dharma's victims was mixed, although it appears most were pleased with his death. The district attorney who prosecuted Dharma cautioned against turning Scarver into a folk hero, noting that Dharma's death was still a murder. On May 15th, 1995, Scarver was sentenced to two additional terms of life imprisonment for the murders of Dharma and Anderson. Dharma had stated in his will that he wished for no services to be conducted and that he wished to be cremated. In September 1995, Dharma's body was cremated and his ashes divided between his parents. Yeah.